Emily Hampshire is someone you may know as Stevie on Schitt's Creek, but she's more than just a talented actor. She's a thoughtful and sensitive person and friend, and in a certain way, we share a bit of history. This conversation weaves in and out of some vulnerable topics, but it also erupts in laughter. Let's just say Emily made me blush. This is 4D with Demi Lovato. Mental health is a lifelong journey. With Talkspace, you can match with a licensed therapist and send them unlimited messages. Using Talkspace feels a little like having a therapist in your pocket. That's why being able to reach out anytime from anywhere makes taking care of my mental health super easy. I'm more relaxed when I'm traveling, knowing if I need to talk, I can just send a message from wherever I am. Working through things in therapy can be tough, but connecting with a therapist isn't. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day as you sign up. You can text video or send voice messages to your licensed therapist, so it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your home. Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. Instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7 and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code 4D to get $100 off of your first month and show your support for the show. That's 4D and Talkspace.com. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for doing this podcast, this show. I'm so excited to have you. Um, this, yeah, this is 4D with me, <laughs> Demi Lovato, and uh, which feels weird every time I say that. But um, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself because I know that a lot of the audience knows you as Stevie Bud in Schitt's Creek, which I'd love. Um, but I want to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, how you want to be known to this it's audience. It's so funny because I've listened to your podcast now and I know you do this. And A, uh-huh. I love that you say it feels weird saying your name all the time because so <laughs> I've been an actor all my life and like introducing myself means like Emily Hampshire, 5'4", and like turning around and I'm based in Los Angeles <laughs> and like... So, yes. but when you say the opportunity to introduce yourself, how you would like to be known, um, I've been thinking about that. And I'm like, how would I really just introduce myself? A, it's just hard to say my name. So I'm Emily Elizabeth Hampshire. And um, I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm an actor, which the, strug- the struggle of do I say actress or actor, that's been, I always. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a, whole, a thing. whole thing. Yes. Um, I'm I'm really artsy crafty. Like I like to make things. Um, I'm Canadian. And um Cute. I, I really do. I real upholstered a couch once. I made a 10 foot long desk. Um I and I love I really love people. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I like miniature things too. I really like miniature things. Like if you go to Sephora, I really like the mini aisle and I love musicals and I like being alone. <laughs> there. That's Do you like many things because we are many people? Like I feel like being short, like we love n- no offense. Yes. We but we are. We are. It's something we both You're know about. You're shorter each other. than me. Um we're not trying to hide. <laughs> <laughs> I am shorter you make than me you. You feel tall. I loved it. When I met you? Oh, my God. Yes. How, wait, how tall are you? I'm 5'3 and some change. And and I find that, like, I tend to like miniature things, too, because, I don't know, I, I grew up being yeah. fun size. Maybe that's it, too, because I'm a denning animal. I also, like, I enjoy being in the closet, not the metaphorical closet, but the actual closet. So I'm, I like little, <laughs> right. I love a pod. That's my favorite place in a plain pod, so... Oh, yes, like the the cool little sweets. Yeah. Well, for those of you who don't know, she is back in the closet for this podcast only. Um, (laughs) She is recording in her podcast. Well, you know what? Let me ask you, what are your pronouns? How about that? That's so interesting. Uh, She, she, her. Those are my pronouns. She, her? Cool. Um, But it's really interesting that I've been thinking about it a lot 
since you came out as non-binary. And then I, I was thinking about it a lot because I feel like we've had so much in common and stuff. And I, I, I don't have any desire to change my pronouns, but I do feel like every issue I've ever had in my life would be so much better if no one prejudged me as being a woman or a girl or female or anything. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I totally relate to that sentiment 100%, which is why I adopted new pronouns. But that's really, really incredible to hear. Thank you for saying that, um, that that had an Big impact imprint. on how yeah. you – well, I want you to know that something that was also very impactful for me was when you came out as pansexual. I mean, I you talked about it, how you learned about it on Shit's Creek, which I think is a really interesting story. Can you elaborate a little bit about well, that? Well, so – we did this scene in Schitt's Creek where um, it's, I think it's kind of well known now, it's the wine scene where um, David, Dan Levy's character, explains to Stevie his sexuality through wine. And he says, you know, ultimately he likes the wine, not the label, and um, and that he's pansexual. And I had never heard the word pansexual before. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I also was having trouble even understanding the whole, I know everyone else got the wine metaphor, but when I was doing the scene, <laughs> I had a bit of trouble because I didn't, it, well, like there's the third wine and like, there's just, I, I had, a, but what was weird was that I've always considered myself super knowledgeable about LGBTQ plus stuff just because everybody in my life, my friends are all mostly LGBTQ plus people, but I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and cut to, you know, about five years later or something, I, um, I was dating someone and, and people I saw on these message boards, people being like, is, is Stevie a lesbian? Is Emily gay? What, who's Emily? Um, and stuff like, like <laughs> asking what I was. And I said to Dan, I was like, this is so weird. What, what am I? Because I truly just fell in love with a person and where they were on the gender spectrum did not matter to me. And since then, it it right. really, it really doesn't matter to me um I have to like the person right. I'm really attracted to like a person's vibe and their yeah right and so he was like you're pansexual don't you watch our show and um <laughs> but then the truth is that since then I did feel kind of like I had to identify myself and and on the one hand I believe in that I believe in visibility I know how important it is on the other hand, my utopian world is like, you don't have to identify yourself as anything that, that why I don't have to say I'm pansexual, bisexual, anything, but I get why we have to now. But also even yeah. with pronouns, like my utopian world would be, we're just like human. And you've, you've pushed people in a way, not on purpose, I don't think, but anyone who I think becomes non-binary, you push people into thinking a little broader and to thinking like human person and and I love that so oh well uh, thank you for for saying that I came out in because I was being asked um and and I guess it, and it was also like a, liberating in a way also a self-discovery thing because you know I um I can look back in high school and see that I wasn't just like wanting to be like the girls. I wanted to like fuck the girls. <laughs> um, ah, yes. So, <laughs> Same. Okay. Because it, it was confusing for a while. And like, oh my God, you yes. have such great tits. I wish I had tits like that. But then I'm like, oh, maybe I will <laughs> do a little more. Um, yes. So it did make me like really start to, uh, I think like Shit's Creek did for a lot of people, made you start to really kind of look deeper into yourself. <laughs> well, look, I, this is kind of a departure from what we're talking about right now, but this is something that I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak about. I wanted to give you a safe space where you can talk freely about something that you have never spoke publicly about 
for the first time. So the truth is, when you asked me to be on your podcast, I was so honored and like, uh, mm. yes. And but then uh, immediately <laughs> I was like, no, I can't because I had told you um something that I, I'd never shared with anybody um, just like that before. So I, I had told you that you, you speaking out about your eating disorder in, in the way that you did, um, especially because it was bulimia and it, I even have trouble saying that word, which is a problem, obviously. But mm -hmm. um, you really affected me when I didn't even know you when it, it was somebody who I really thought it, I was so disgusting and like it was such a gross mm. secret and and to see you talk right. about it and also this is the weirdest thing Jane Fonda who's the only other person that I ever unsolicitedly told I saw her on a plane once I I sat in my seat during turbulence and wrote her this crazy letter. Um, and I, because I'd read her book when I was younger and her talking about being an actress with an eating disorder that was similar to mine. Um, I, yeah. uh, I just felt less ashamed. And it's funny that the only people I have actually ever told, like people in my life know because I went to treatment and they had to, you know, they knew, um, not many, not mm -hmm. many at all. I told you because you have really helped me. And I told Jane Fonda, I said, I wrote this letter <laughs> at the end. I gave her the letter and then I saw her again in, and I was so weird. I'm not usually starstruck. I was so <laughs> weird. And so now I have total empathy whenever a fan comes up to me. And if they're weird, I'm like, I've been weird too. Um, and <laughs> then she came up to me in costumes and I was like, no, because so, all the things I said and, and she was so lovely to me. But anyways, Aww. so the reason, the, the main reason was I then I listened to your podcast and Mm -hmm. I listened to Glennon Doyle and I listened to your Jane Fonda and um, yeah. it just made me realize that I can't, I don't, I don't need to talk about this. I don't, but I doing a show like Shit's Creek, you do start to get things for letters from people, letters like 80 DMs, yes. DMs from people <laughs> who, um, who tell you how y you being authentic and open has helped them be like that. And and it actually reminds me of um, Carson Kressley came on this little pandemic charity show I was doing. And he, um, he was talking about the power of coming out. And he said, you know, there's always, always people who pave the way for you to make your way easier. And, and the yeah. power of coming out is saying, is, is making it human. And when you make it human, then other people are kind of like, I mean, this was about, you know, being gay for him, but it was um, that when you make it human, it, it, people, friends can be like, well, I know Carson and he's a great guy. Why shouldn't he be able to adopt kids? And I know, you yes. know, and so you make it human. And quite honestly, I think my my coming out and this issue are kind of closely related in, in that um you and Jane Fonda <laughs> ma Aww. made it human to me and not, um, yeah, it was something I was, just because I was also, you know, when I've always been an actress and um, when I started out, um, I, I started out when I was like 11 and then I kind of became a teenager and Kate Moss was very big then and like as, mm -hmm. yeah. I, re I relate to that that period of time where it was young Hollywood and the fashion industry were very everyone was very un unhealthily yes thin for to be looking for for teenagers to be looking yes up to. and especially when you're going yeah teenagers you're kind of looking for your identity and I I remember my I remember viscerally my first diet I tore it out of a magazine and it was. Um, two hard-boiled eggs, half a cup of oatmeal, and black coffee. And I remember that first diet 
in retrospect, I can see how much that made me feel like I was in control of my life. Um, yes. Because it wasn't a period of time when I was in control of it. And as and I do think back to then that like, what if I never start had a did that diet? What yeah. if because I, I a friend of mine once said he was like, I've never seen anybody react to a salad the way you do. <laughs> and um <laughs> and it's it's true, it made it it made all of it something so conscious and thought about all the time. I mean, I I started to go on these diet pills and mm -hmm. I'd actually, I'd gotten my first TV show in Canada and I did the first season. I was normal, did, came back for the second season and I had lost a significant amount of weight and everybody said I looked great. Everybody said, oh, the wardrobe was like, oh, we can have these clothes on you and these clothes now. By the end of the season, they weren't saying I looked so great um, and because I, cause I right. couldn't think anymore. I couldn't remember anything. Right. I was crying all the time. Um, and then I got really depressed because my brain wasn't being fed at all. And I also was white knuckling through being, I, I guess I never thought of myself as anorexic, but I was really, right. you know, white knuckling it through that, counting everything. And then I couldn't do it anymore. And I got depressed and I put on a significant amount of weight. And I went back to that series and I played an actress on that series. Um, and they wrote it into the show. They were like, my character's name was Siobhan. And they were like, we can't keep Siobhan away from the craft table. And there was all these <gasps> things of me, me like under the craft table, like stuffing my face, doing all this stuff. I was so embarrassed, but also <laughs> because I... There was one podcast where you talked about how you could look at your perfectionism, how uh, what it's done good for you sometimes. And mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. this is not a good lesson. This is not a good lesson at all. But it did make me learn comedy in a really hard lesson oh, way. Oh, wow. Because I then, I, at the time, I was, I was the bigger girl. And, um, and in that way, I needed to be funny. That's what was going through my head, you know, and that's not a healthy thing to think about. Um, but it pushed right. me in that direction. And in that I got more character parts. I got, I was no longer the, um, the girlfriend. And I was always the girlfriend, right. like the pretty girl. The, and I can see in retrospect that I might have purposefully ruined my looks um, because I didn't like that always being a focus. Um, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. That's so – there's so much to unpack there. I'm sitting here like trying not to be livid at the writers for writing that into the script because that's not – um, and I know you're not ever going to say No, anything, but I think it was a but... different time. I think it was a time when my right. agent would tell me, well, you either have to gain weight or lose it. You're either the fat girl or you're skinnier. And I would go to, if I went to a party and I would, he would see me eat anything, I would be like, don't, don't worry, I'm just going to throw it up. And that was my best joke. My best joke all the time. Right. And, but it, it was true and it, it did get out of hand for me. And actually the thing that I think saved my life was going I went in right before right before Schitt's Creek I went into treatment and um and yeah I'd come it, I'd come out um it was a month I'd come out and then I went and did Schitt's Creek and yeah wow mm -hmm. isn't it incredible that when sometimes you start to turn your life around opportunities can come out of nowhere, like out the blue and really help shape the rest of yeah. your life. I fully believe that because, you know, you – it's funny to say took control of your eating disorder because eating disorders are all about control. But it's funny when you decided to get help for that, that this opportunity came along and, you know, gave you the platform that you have today – because of it, um, I think it was the universe's way maybe of saying, hey, you're on the right path and like yeah. keep it up because I fully believe that the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, 
doesn't want you to be hurting yourself, especially for the to, for the ability to appeal to other people. Yeah. And I think that we I I I definitely I definitely did that and, and as well, you know, being a a teenager in Hollywood trying to make yourself shrink as much possible as much as possible, it I can completely relate so to that. So that word shrink is also yeah. just on so many levels. I um I have a lot of trans women friends and um one of them uh was talking she was going to do an interview and um and she, she was talking about what she did best uh, it was her career that she was talking about she's very confident when she talked about her career and she was like oh i feel like i'm like a boy scout what do i what do i do to seem more femme and i can't believe what came out, came out of my mouth was um make yourself smaller and it was it was true she did seem more femme being like mm. but it that will always stick with me because it is something that i feel like for the longest time i i did try to especially being canadian you never want to put people out and you want to please people and i'm sorry for existing and all those things oh my god <laughs> but um but yeah that 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 thing of sh shrinking yourself both physically and metaphorically in a weird way um and yeah when i came out of treatment my entire life changed i i can't say that it cured my eating disorder but it made it of made course. me find a self or even know that i had a self in me because everything was like i'd go i learned who i was by going to auditions and looking in the other person and seeing well what do you want me to be and that was very much what i would do even with guys relationships i'd i'd find out what they liked i'd look on like like a psycho on their instagram and see what their like ex-girlfriend yeah. oh he likes girls with with their nails done and i'd start doing my nails mm -hmm. and be of like and then they'd like me and i'd be like you don't and then i'd be like break up with them because they didn't you don't yeah. really like me you would you would well you would do what you did with that role which was you subconsciously mm. <laughs> chose a different pathway and you said Hey, you know, I realize you don't like me yeah. for who I am, and that's not that's not okay yeah. with me. Um, yeah, I, I relate to that too. I, I just like remember listening to your Glennon Doyle interview that there is so much in retrospect that you can see that you couldn't when you were in it, um, and and, and how that journey has made you who you are in in overcoming things like that. Um, and I yeah. think that's also why I think I wanted to do your podcast. And uh, it, it wasn't mm. so much that I wanted to speak about it as much as I didn't feel like I could do your podcast and be real. Um, because you talk, you know, you, right. you talk about your struggles and um, yeah. And I just also, I guess before, had I ever spoken about it before, it would have been what defined me because I wasn't established in any way and I never wanted that. And so I feel like now um, it's kind of like, well, I'd, li I'd like to give back what you did for me. Like it really, it really, oh. I will never forget seeing you the first time on this talk show talking about stuff that. I couldn't believe you were saying. I couldn't believe you were saying because to me it was so humiliating. Um, and not that, you know, but it... No, no, no. I totally get that. You know, I think there's also there's also a, a taboo or kind of stigma that comes with bulimia as opposed to, I think, the other eating disorders that, that feels a little bit more embarrassing. Because... Um, because you are making yourself sick. You know, it kind of, there's there's gross things that come with that. I think that our society rewards anorexia in the yep. diet culture. Like, unfortunately, we, if you, these, th those diets are still being printed to this yeah. day. The two hard-boiled eggs and a cup of oatmeal, you know, it, all you have to do is open up one of those fitness magazines and it'll basically say the same thing. Our society rewards People who Trill. are in control of yeah. themselves. 
And and that's just not where it's at. And that's not where freedom is. And that's not where self-love resides. You don't find self-love by by losing weight. I'm sorry. That's just not how it happens. You Mm -hmm. can. There are some people that lose weight and they find self-love, but that's, for me, that's not how I found it. In fact, freedom has always come from taking contrary action, taking care of myself, Mm -hmm. you know, not, not stuffing my face when I, when I don't want to. That's obviously not self-care, but um, it's by, continuing to work on myself that's where I find the freedom and Glennon Doyle actually said that that thing about like you can't have both you can't love yourself and be in control like because you're not trusting yourself and to have self-love and that really struck me and I remember when I went into treatment my first day I was I felt like the, the fat one, because it made me bigger. It made me, you know, and I was like, I didn't feel like I was even entitled to say I had a problem or anything. And I, I remember my first meeting with the therapist. She was, I was saying, you know, this, this is nice. This isn't really going to work for me because um, you, you couldn't do those behaviors there. You were watched all the time. And then I said, you know, I won't do it here for yeah. this you know, month. Um, but I'll be okay. Like, uh, it won't change. And she's like, usually what we find when we take the behaviors away that in a week or two, other things start to come up. And I was like, yeah, yes. yeah. Then I found myself in, uh, <laughs> we did this thing called life story where you had to tell your life story. Um, I had to look at my IMDB page to be able to tell, remember my life story, which is it I is insane, and I remembered all my my weights from those. Sh- anyways, um, yeah, well, of course. Of I mean, you say anyways, but I could do the same thing with past projects as well. Um, it's something that just yeah. comes with it. And yeah. so I was telling my life story, and something that I um, had I had always thought, you know, I was cool with it, not cool with it, but I was, it didn't affect me was my, my stepfather dying. And I started sobbing, like, like I'd never sobbed before and like so uncontrollably. And the therapist was like, how do you, how do you feel? And I actually said, I, I feel like not like throwing up, but this feels like throwing up. This feels like that feeling after that feeling after that I always did feel like there was a calm after the storm and that, and I realized a lot of my things were not speaking, not saying things, not keeping things down, keeping things, you know, and, um, and that was something that, again, it sounds, I'm not this person who's like throwing up as a metaphor for like, but, but it was what I was doing when I could, you know, when you do therapy and you can see the connection, then it kind of helps to make it go away. If you're okay with talking about your recovery, can I ask you what that looks like today and how you're doing today? Yeah. Um, well, like I said, I don't know that I'll ever be cured. I, I wish I do fantasize about like, imagine what it would be like to not think of about course. everything. However, I can, this is a weird thing, but I think the thing that helped my eating disorder the most <laughs> was sleeping with women. <laughs> that sounds crazy. But I always, but the truth is I always had this, I was so strict with myself and so punishing with like, this is bad about you, this is bad about you. And then when I, and and mm-hmm. want to be skinnier, skinnier. And then when I was with women, I was like, oh, I don't want them to be skinny. Oh, I like this about them. I like, right. it was attractive to me that someone wasn't, right. It's and this is personal, it's just not attractive to me. And that actually really made me see things differently in myself because I was always looking at judging myself through the male gaze, judging my, and, and not even yeah. necessarily what their male gaze was, but what society was saying they wanted. Um, well, Here's the thing. If we're talking about Jane Fonda, she made a really good point. It all comes back to the patriarchy. You know what I'm saying? Even if it's not 
the patriarchy saying, this is what we like. It's the patriarchy running the fashion industries that's putting the clothes on the models that we see walking down the runway, telling us that that's what they like. And so it does come down, it comes back to the patriarchy. And, you know, when, when, when you start to think, how do I need to look you go to you start to think of well what is the patriarchy like you yes. don't think of what do what do i like in a woman or what do you think what do they like in yes. a woman what do they see who's on the cover of magazines who's on our television you know you're looking at at what they are putting in front of us and it actually does come back to that especially when the patriarchy's mission is and and i'm not i'm not saying when i say patriarchy i'm not talking about all you know, straight white men. I'm just talking about the ones that rule mm. shit. Um, they most of the time, they they don't like loud women, women with strong women with loud opinions. When you say that that sleeping with women helped you, I have to I have to say the same thing that I think there is a freedom that comes with dating women where I just don't automatically feel the pressure to make myself smaller. And there's a freedom in just accepting each other for where we're at that like that that's really why I see I see myself ending up with a woman. I don't really see myself ending up with a man. And now who's I don't know what's gonna happen in my future, but that's just where what I what I feel because I feel it feels safer with a woman for some reason. And and maybe that's because I feel like my eating disorder had to do with so many parts of me that I was shoving down, one of which was uh, the side of me that likes girls. And mm-hmm. uh, I'm sorry, the side of me that loves mm-hmm. girls. And um, because I have, I've been, I have had very, very intense feelings for women. And 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 yeah, I, growing up in the South, it was really hard for me to open up and tell people that. You know, I remember hearing of a friend that went to a friend's friend that went to a different school and she was bisexual and I was like oh, I have to meet her because I got to talk to her I need to like I I think and I was like oh she's hot and I didn't even really think she was that hot but I was like she's bi and I'm probably bi so like we need to talk yeah. I don't know it just felt like that was a part of me I was always stuffing down and there's your fucking analogy with bulimia when you stuff things down too long it's gonna overflow at some point there is that thing of like the diet of a secrets keep you sick and it and it it yes. is true it is true that if yes. and it doesn't mean you have to go and like share everything but there is something in just like not hiding anymore mental health is a lifelong journey with talkspace you can match with a licensed therapist and send them unlimited messages Using Talkspace feels a little like having a therapist in your pocket. That's why being able to reach out anytime from anywhere makes taking care of my mental health super easy. I'm more relaxed when I'm traveling, knowing if I need to talk, I can just send a message from wherever I am. Working through things in therapy can be tough, but connecting with a therapist isn't. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day as you sign up. You can text, video, or send voice messages to your licensed therapist So it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your home. Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. Instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7 and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code 4D to get $100 off of your first month and show your support for the show. That's 4D and Talkspace.com. Can I say how we first met? And not not even met. Yes. Because I think it's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> sure, go for it. Go for okay. it. I don't care. <laughs> so I have to say that you DM'd me and you said. I did. I slid in those DMs. <laughs> you slid in my DMs and you said, hey, girl, yes. uh, I'd like you on the show. We should kick it sometime. And then, then you said <laughs> below it. You said, and by kick it, I mean, like, go on a date. I find you attractive or whatever. Like, you made it clear that it was a date. Yeah, yeah. And I loved that because I was like, 
sometimes that's confusing, you know, like, hey, totally I'm decades older than you. So kick it. I was like, look, at it. <laughs> you said that you also said that you were like, I'm decades older. I don't think we'll think find the same things funny. I was like, mm, excuse you. And I sent you a really yeah, good meme. And you also said, think of uh, Sarah Paulson and Holland Taylor. <laughs> no. And then right after you were like, oh, I don't mean you're the Holland Taylor. I was like, mom. Yeah, no, yeah, you did, and I'm like, I think that I was, was like, like, no, no, I just love them too. together. I really do. <laughs> Me too. That was the funniest thing in the world because I was oh. the Holland Taylor in that situation. Proud to be. <laughs> Proud to be. <laughs> Proud to be. I look a, a non-binary person can dream you know what I mean and 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 they she I at the time I was a she she was dreaming she was dreaming yeah. big <laughs> so I was like let's 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 see what yeah. let's see what can happen what's the worst that can happen and then I made a really good yeah. friend you know what I'm saying like you're an, you're a dope oh. friend and I'm ex- I'm happy that we became me friends too I wish you were 29 um so yeah. <laughs> also though, there was something about that um I I did ask you. I'm like, is uh, have uh, are you out publicly? As because I didn't know that you were into women, and um, and most people ask me if I'm into women, and like they assume, and I'm like, what made you think that? And they're like, it's the plaids, the plaid shirts. <laughs> <laughs> that was before before any like when people would just assume that I was a lesbian. Um, but yeah, I didn't right. know. And I was like, have you, and you said that you, you hadn't done it publicly, but, but you've had all like for a while now, it's been something that you. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Oh my God. That's so funny. <laughs> Wait, I love, this is so great because like, that is not a moment that we have had on this podcast. And I'm so glad that, <laughs> I think you brought that up. That is so funny. Oh, my God. Also, not my smoothest move being like Holland Taylor, Sarah Pulse. <laughs> I'm so sorry no, about that. I, I loved it. What was even better, because, I mean, they are, I'm obsessed with them. I, I think everyone wants yes. to see them. Um, oh, yeah, yes. But it was the digging yourself out. It was the, oh, my God, I did it. Oh, Lena. my did God. It. Yes, the foot in my... <laughs> I, think, I think at that point I was sending you voice yeah. notes being like, no, that's not what I meant. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, man. But then I... And then I met you the at... Grammys. The Grammys. Yeah. And that was... That was awesome. I got to... My mom got to meet you. My mom is such a big fan of Your Shit's mom, Creek. Your mom, I love her. And she was just so excited. Oh, my God. Well... Yeah. Well, she I loves follow you, her on Instagram, and... so I think I... No, you yeah. don't! Oh, my God, That's amazing. I, I love that. I know that. her more than... I actually know her because I see her <laughs> life and I think I know it, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god wait that's hilarious oh i love that wow um <laughs> i'm a little where, flustered where do we go from sliding into my dms i know <laughs> where do we go from here i slide out the room <laughs> just kidding no i'm totally kidding um no I, well here's the thing you are an attractive woman who like knows her shit she you have you you're not afraid to be yourself and I think that's what I was like that's fucking dope you know what I'm saying and I think that like no matter whatever happens like with with people that you know I date at once or find attractive at once like that's like ultimately we end up being friends you know what I'm saying because like I'm I'm single as a Pringle Same. right now and I, and and I, I love it. And now I have a lot of dope friends that some of which I've dated, some of which that I've not dated, but like found attractive. And it's it's cool that like you can that when it's cool when you can make that transition of like, OK, just because it didn't work with someone or like nothing yeah. happened, then like it's still cool that you can still remain friends because obviously like that's I'm attracted to me what I Me? yeah the, to what I attracted yeah, to you to you <laughs> yes yes okay still I'm still attracted to you fine <laughs> you know you said you're single and I'm I'm this is yes. we're never gonna get out of this loop but um, <laughs> but 
I also like. I have realized that um, I I went through a, a difficult breakup, and it it kind of forced me to really go to therapy and look at myself because I I was all about the other person, and that was something that. I did before mm. that person that I didn't recognize, but everything was about me not having any needs and any self. And now that I've finally gotten mm. to, after lots of expensive, expensive therapy, I've gotten to a place where I l- love me so much and be and doing what I want to do that yes. I'm scared to get yes. into a relationship because I'm worried I'm going to just give that up and like. I know. I have gotten to that point, too, where I'm like, but wait, I really love my Grey's Anatomy (laughs) marathons that I have by myself that like I don't I don't know if someone who I did is going to be interested in that. And like or like (laughs) me. Okay. Okay. fine. Fine. I'm like, but 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 what about a comedy? I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) But see that right there. That right there is what I'm talking about. I, I want. I don't know. I I don't want to ever sacrifice who I am at, for the expense of being in a relationship with someone else. And that's where like there you know, I could we both could be dating people. That's we're single because we haven't settled for anything less than what we deserve because we value ourselves so much now that we don't want to just give that power away to just yeah. anybody. We know what we're yeah. worth. And I think that's really admirable. Do you do you find that now that b- when I've been saying to people I'm like I don't want to be in a relationship with anyone then everyone wants to be in a relationship with you when you're like no I don't totally. like I'm just I just don't want to do that. But I think it does come out of <laughs> what's funny is when you were like I love that we're friends and nothing happened once again bringing it back to the patriarchy you know how that can never happen yeah. usually with guys that if you say you can't go out with them or something they're like who the fuck do you think you are like you think you're all the- totally totally but you were like yeah it wasn't that I didn't want to date you by the way I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm just I'm just tr- I was trying to be like like I'm <laughs> like, like what? Like what? <laughs> I'm just trying to be like. Okay, okay. <laughs> Here, I got one for you. I I know how to I know okay. how to do this. Okay. Speaking of prioritizing yourself, what about your new project? <laughs> Chapel Chapel wait. Chapel Chapel wait. wait. We can talk okay, about that. So, yeah. Jubble Weight is a, um, it's a 10-part limited series. <laughs> Which I can't wait to watch, it's by the a, way. It looks scary yeah, as fuck. Yeah, it's really, it's really, well, it's Stephen King. It's based on a Stephen King book, and it's um, uh, with Adrian Brody, who, uh, Academy Award winner Adrian Brody, who, you know, he knows yeah. the stuff. And, um yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> and it's set in 1850s, which and why I really wanted to do this project was so I had when this project came to me, um, I had just sold my own show that I'm a writer on. And it's the first time I'm being on the other side of things. And um, I was reading this Stephen King book called On Writing. And because he wrote a book about writing, it's really great. And I get this script for this this show and my character is a writer in the 1850s and um she went to like Mount Holyoke she's really ahead of her time this modern woman and she's not in the original book um and so I think because Stephen King likes to put writers in things but he didn't put a woman in this one I think I'm like the female Stephen King of this story you know if Stephen King were a very educated ahead of her time woman in the 1850s wearing a corset he would be my character Rebecca Morgan was there any scary things spooky things that happened on set Um, or was that just no there is that just something I think of every time I see a horror movie I'm like there had to have been some shit that went down on Uh, that set well (laughs) there there was um first of all the house that so the the show is called Chapel Wait, and it's Chapel Wait is the house yeah. that they move into that has yes. all this history, and so the house that played the part of Chapel Wait, like the actor house, um, yeah, <laughs> it was a method actor house because it was 
haunted. It was no joke haunted. It was an Airbnb and they had this plaque on the wall that said like everybody who lived there and everybody who lived there um died in a really not great way. And we'd hear like, they're still pissed about it because we'd hear slamming doors and like no one would be there. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. So. Ooh. See, that's what makes me scared to work on like a, on a, on a scary project. Cause I'm like, Ooh, the energy, like, is it, was it, was it hard or was it, was it okay? So, so again, it's based on this short story and I read the short story cause I'm a professional. I do my homework and whatever. And then I, um, we start shooting, uh, I'm around the fourth episode that we're shooting and we got, the, we didn't get all the scripts at once. We'd get them in a series thing. And, um, I'm doing this show. I'm sitting in my chair on set. It's kind of dark on set because it's a horror thing. So it's dark. I look to my left and, and there's a, a vampire. Um, and, and not like a vampire, like Rob Pattinson vampire, like a terrifying <laughs> vampire. I didn't know there were vampires in the show. I thought because they weren't in the short <laughs> story. I was the only one who didn't know. And so when you're an actor, I think the union needs to tell actors, like, when you're on set and you're not <laughs> expecting a vampire and then a really... Yeah, they need to tell you. So that was, like, one of the most terrifying moments of my life. I jumped out of my chair because you just, you don't expect it. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. Absolutely, of course. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's really funny. Before we wrap it up, um, I wanted to go back really quick to talking about your recovery because I just think that it's really important that um that people hear you know the other mm -hmm. side of it do you have any advice for anybody that may be struggling today or they're about to go off to treatment for the first time or you know or, or maybe they're they're not at the point yet of being ready to accept help like treatment mm -hmm. what would you what advice would you give to them um, I, I mean, I would say that the best thing you could probably do for yourself is to talk about it and, and get at that, yeah. which I, I think because that was the thing for me that was so keeping that even secret that uh, like the, the more you kind of keep secrets like that, you kind of stew in this shame soup. And, and I think shame is, is just a, an emotion that can kind of rot you inside. And, um, this yeah. is not, this doesn't sound like great advice, but, um, but I just do, I do <laughs> remember, um, this therapist once saying that, you know, like de depression a lot of times can be anger when inwards that you're not you're not letting you're not using your voice to say things and i think a lot of again the, the patriarchy um there was yes. a lot i was raised that you know uh it's it's rude to ask for things you don't um you don't don't be loud don't be aggressive as a yes. woman um letting yourself take up more more space and not um also what's been good for me is now when i look on instagram it i love when i see like younger kids like 16 year olds who are like they're they're proud of their bodies and they're not and not not in yes. like a, like you know there's a there's a way that it, it just feels like it yes. wasn't it wasn't like that when I was younger. It was like you had to be perfect mm -hmm. or you were you made fun of and all those things. And now there's really this culture I find with younger people of so much acceptance. And I do think that comes from visibility. I think I think what Schitt's Creek did for showing um, a, a gay couple who were just normal. They just loved each other. It was normal. And so yeah. I think showing people, and again, kind of why I wanted to not not talk about this, um, that, yeah. that it's, it, it's, it's, not, it, it's not something to, like, feel embarrassed about or feel like you're dysfunctional for. If anything, listen to yes. Glennon Doyle's speech and, it, like, her, her interview, <laughs> and it, it's really 
inspiring. The shame soup is something that I'm going to take with me forever. <laughs> you you literally said two words, shame soup. And I can relate to like so much to that because there is so many times where like you make one mistake and you end up sitting in a pot of shame yeah. soup. I have one more question and it is not about dinner yeah. on Saturday, <laughs> but um <laughs> It could be. Uh, <laughs> just, I ask everybody this question when they come on my podcast. It's called 4D with me because for me, living in the fourth dimension looks like complete freedom from boundaries that separate all of us, like gender, sexuality, opinions, just all the things that separate us, age, whatever it is. Like, What would living in the fourth dimension look like to you? So I think sometimes I'm very literal. And um, and to me, when I think of 4D, I think of you're seeing me from here, from here, from here, from here. And if you're seeing me from all those angles, there's nowhere to hide anything. And so it does, it Ooh. feels very kind of, you have to be you in your birthday suit. And like, and yeah, it feels like a place where you can't, there's no hiding. You just are who you authentically are because everyone's going to see it anyways. So being caught hiding is like not a good look. Okay. That is one of the coolest answers that I've gotten to that question on this show. Yes, because I think that a lot of times people don't take that question literally. <laughs> And, and, and you are, but <laughs> no, no, it's just, but I, I, but I love the fact that you did take it literally because no one's taken that approach with it. And that's, what's so cool about giving this question and getting a different answer each time. I love the question. You know, I think it's cool. Thanks. Well, I had so much fun, a little too much fun. <laughs> I'm going to have to come out of the closet. Oh, you you are going to have to come out at some point. <laughs> Sa Saturday? Okay. Bye. Saturday, 8 p.m. See you there. Cool. Bye. <laughs> Look, I'll, I'll DM you. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but, no, it was very, 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 very nice awesome you. having you. Thank you for sharing what you did for the first time publicly on this show. I, I want you to know that my fans and anyone listening – um, it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of guts to come on the show and talk about something as vulnerable as what you just did. And and my fans are going to – I know my fans, they're, they're so loving and caring and they will be supporting you 100% from now on as well. Thank you. So you have not only support a supporter in me, but you have – a supporter from all of my fans too. I just know it. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's really nice. Of course, <laughs> it was so good so to good see to you. See and you. we. You look great. <laughs> okay. So good to see you. Thanks. So to you. So good, thanks. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs>